All right. What's going on, everybody? How you all doing? Welcome back to another Coffee q and I'm Jay here on the Ono Coffee channel. And today we're topic is signature beverages, specifically signature beverages for the Barista Championship. And then even more specifically for the upcoming qualifiers that are happening here in the United States for the, at the end of the month. And they're happening here in Baltimore. And I just thought, you know what? Hey, we're all going to be there checking it out. So let's have a little discussion about signature beverages and what uh, what you might need to think about. How y'all doing? Hope you guys are doing well today. Thank you for tuning in. If you have me watching this on the replay, feel free to drop questions down or comments down in the comments below. But if you're here now, drop them here in the comments on over to my left and uh, your right, and we'll... Uh, you know, we'll make it happen. All right, so what we're going to do today, we're just going to go over some ideas about signature beverage. And let me get off this jacket. This dope jacket that I have here, I picked up from Townsend's in Pearson, Indiana last week. I got to visit, uh, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with them, Townsend's here on YouTube, they do a lot of uh, recreations of life back in the, the 1800s, 1700s, 1700s, 18th century. And uh, really great, really great stuff. I've always been enjoying it. And um, I got to visit their their, uh, their headquarters last week, and they took me on a little bit of a tour. I got to be in the Nutmeg Tavern there and met John and Andy and Lauren and the whole production team. And really cool to, to visit with bigger YouTubers that have, you know, that have different perspective and just let get to listen to what they have to say about it. Anyway, let's first talk about the Barista Championship. So the Barista Championship is basically a competition that is being held worldwide that the, each competitor will come and give 15-minute presentations serving three sets of drinks to four sensory judges. And those drinks are espresso beverage, milk beverage, and that's basically espresso with some kind of milk, and then signature beverage where they use the espresso to create a beverage of their own creation. And pretty much the sky's the limit with the exception that they cannot have any kind of food, that it cannot be chewable, and it cannot have alcohol. And other than that, the competitor is free to create whatever they want. So that's kind of what we want to talk to you today about the signature beverage. Now, this is for, this is you know, in light of the qualifiers that are happening here in the United States. And the United States is a little bit of a different beast where it's such a large country with so many competitors that there's so many people that want to participate in the national championship that they've had to create a system that they would reduce the amount of numbers that are getting to the nationals, right? So let's say we can only have, let's pretend they can only have 25 people in the nationals and let's say 400 people want to participate. Well, these preliminary and qualifying rounds allow those people to compete. And if they place well enough, they move on to the next round and eventually make it to the nationals. And hopefully they'll, whoever wins the nationals goes to the world championship and perhaps that person can win the world. But right now we're just here at the qualifying rounds and the qualifying rounds, which is, I guess, the second tier of competition, the competitions themselves, the presentations themselves are truncated, meaning that they are shortened. So instead of having espresso, milk and signature, it only has espresso and signature drink. The milk beverage is omitted. And instead of having 15 minutes, they have 10 minutes. So 10 minutes to present. And then you have a potential of 60 seconds extra to go over time before disqualification at 11 minutes. We're not going to worry too much about those other regulations. What we're going to do today is talk more about the signature beverage. And I have put a link down below in the description to the qualifying rounds page so you can see whatever uh, details are for the qualifying rounds. But more importantly, that heater is just beating on my back. But more importantly, <clears throat> there is a link down below as well to the rules and regulations for the championship or for the qualifying round. And those are a little bit different than what we use at the world level. So you might, if you, if you are planning on competing, and the last time I heard last week, I heard there were like 20 spots left in the barista uh, portion of the qualifying round. So if you've been thinking about it, you should go for it, go for it. I know it costs a little bit of money. It's like 200, $300, which is, I think quite a lot to compete. Like, if, you know, we're talking about baristas, and baristas don't normally have, they're not the highest paid uh, position in a company. So, 
anyway, it would be better if they had it at a lower price point. But anyway, if you're interested, join now. I think there are still some spots left. But first of all, you know, I don't have the, the normal setup that I normally use for the other live stream. So I don't, I'm, not, I'm unable to do overlays today. But if you go down below to the link in the description and click on the, the link for the, the rules and regulations, we can follow. you can follow along as I'm talking about it. And specifically what I want you to do is come down to section 5.1.2, which is about the signature beverage. And section five is really about um, standards and definitions and specifically beverage definitions. And that's what, we, what, that's what we want to focus on, first of all, is to understand what is a signature beverage. So there are a few, there's like nine categories, nine specific details as to what is a signature beverage. Number one, A or should I say 5.1.2, signature beverage A, a signature beverage demonstrates a competitor's creativity and skill to create an appealing and individual espresso-focused beverage. Cool. So what that really means is that it's um, they're looking for creative drinks that are based or espresso-based. So you want to have the flavor of the espresso be promin a prominent part uh, of the flavor profile of the drink. Like, you know, you can go to Starbucks and you can get their frappuccinos, whatever frappuccino you may all buy, they are putting espresso in it, but pretty much that espresso is washed over. That's not what this is about. You want there to be a predominant flavor of espresso, or at least a complementary and perceptible flavor of espresso with whatever ingredients you're going to be using. 5.1.2B, the signature beverage should be a liquid beverage. The judges must be able to drink it. Food may accompany the beverage, but only the beverage item will be evaluated and scored. So where does this come around from? Back in the old days of the competition, like almost 20 years ago, I think it was a competitor by the name of Paul Bassett, who eventually became the world barista champion. This guy's from Australia, and he had a drink where he placed a, a piece of cooked kangaroo meat in the drink. And evidently that freaked a whole bunch of people out. This is before that, that I was involved with the competitions. Or actually, I think it was even before I got into coffee itself. And they created this rule because they didn't want you to use any kind of food product. And so you can't put any food. And basically the way to think about it is it, it cannot be chewable. And if you present anything that has chewable stuff, the judges may or may not drink it. They, may, they probably will not consume it. Also, one of the concerns... Back in the old days was that, you know, what if you have a vegan judge? What's the vegan judge going to do, right? So, or something like that. All right. 5.1.2C. Each of the four ginger beverages must contain a minimum of one espresso per, one espresso shot per the definition of espresso in 5.1.1. Otherwise, the competitor will receive a score of zero points for taste balance on the sensory score sheet in the signature beverage category for that corresponding beverage. And that's a pretty significant thing to keep in mind. You want to have a minimum of one espresso shot. So if you're pulling four shots of espresso, you want to make sure you serve them all. And typically if you're like, let's say if we're serving, if we're taking like an espresso and we are, actually I should zoom in some here. If we're taking the espresso, and let's say we're pulling that in a shot, on the espresso machine, we're pulling it like this. You pull a shot that the, you split the two shots in the machine or from the into the cups, and there's really no issue as to whether or not they're going to have the full shot, right? Now, what this is really specifically referring to is a lot of competitors will pull all four shots, combine them all into a container where they'll mix all the other ingredients, and then they'll portion out the four drinks for the competitors. Now, sometimes people make a lot of product, a lot of liquid, leaving an amount of liquid in a container. So let's say, for example, the competitor in making their cinder drink has filled up, you know, the pitcher to here, right? or, or just filled up the pitcher. And then after mixing all the ingredients together, that competitor serves all four drinks but they leave a good amount of product, mixed product in here. 
because all the shots are combined with all the ingredients, we now presume that because there's more product left in here, it is not one shot per drink. Therefore, you get zeros in taste balance. And how does that affect you, right? So taste balance... Oh, here's, a, here's something that they have to update. In the rules, it says taste balance. On the updated score sheets, it's taste experience. So they need to update this part. I don't know why they haven't, but there's a typo. But basically, the taste experience and the taste experience score here actually is worth up to six points, but it has a multiplier of two. So you're talking about 12 points. You're talking... 48 potential points that you're losing out on. And you don't want to do that. That's a that's a big problem. So you want to make sure that you serve everything so that you at least have the best chance of getting your thing. And I see mom's here. Mom, what's going on, man? Good afternoon to you. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome. It's good to see you. All right. So if you're interested, so if you're just joining us, um, we're going over the rules for the Singer Beverage. I've got the link to the rules and regulations in the description right here. <laughs> if you click on that, it'll take you to the right PDF and then scroll down to 5.1.2, which is the signature beverage definitions of the drink. And that's kind of what we're going over at the moment. All right, so 5.1.2D, is that right? Yeah. Espresso used in the signature beverage must be prepared during the competitor's performance time Otherwise, the signature beverage will receive a score for zero of zero for taste balance on all the sensory score sheets in the signature beverage category. <laughs> so that means that the espresso that you're using in, in the signature beverage must be made during your presentation time. So for the qualifying rounds, it'll be during those 10 minutes that you're doing your performance. You must make those shots for the drink in that time. Now, if you make more, if you if you make it outside of that, like you can't bring it in from your, there, there is a preparation time, you can't make it then. You can't bring it from outside. You have to make it on stage. Otherwise, you get zeros and taste, taste experience again. So don't do any of those things. Those are, by the time you get to the competition, you should be able to pull the shots on the fly kind of the minimum requirement as a barista, you know? All right, so it's 5.1.2 Echo. The singer beverage must be served at a consumable temperature. Competitors are encouraged to explain the reason for serving the singer beverage at the chosen temperature. So basically what that means, you must be able, it must be at a temperature that you can drink. And I think really the, the fear there is the drink is too hot. Like it could scald the palates of the judges and that's problematic in many ways. Many just from a on a personal basis, if you're the one drinking it, you don't want to scald your palate. You know, just because it's just it hurts and it's you know how it is. You get those you get those uh, flabs of dead skin on the top of the roof of your mouth. That just that's just always a, a distraction. And on top of that, the judge how will have to, invariably will have to judge subsequent competitors. So you don't want to put them at a disadvantage in that respect. That could come to play bad havoc on you later. They say it's encouraged to explain why you're serving the temperature, the serving during the temperature. That's always a good practice. Let us know, let the judges know why you're serving at that temperature. Is there any particular reason why it's cold or hot or somewhere in between? All right, 512F. Any ingredients may be used in a singular beverage preparation except alcohol, alcohol extracts, or byproducts, and controlled or illegal substances. The use of vinegar, such as red wine vinegar and the like, is permitted. If these substances are found in the beverage, competitors will receive zero points in all categories available on the sensory score sheets in the singular beverage category. <laughs> wow, that's like some complete zeros and everything. That would be that would be devastating to your performance. So, again, like we said about earlier, no alcohol. Now, here they say alcohol extracts. Pretty much any extract that you're using in production today is alcohol-based. So that's where it's a little bit – like if you use vanilla extract, there's no real vanilla extract that's being made today that I'm aware of 
that is not used to utilizing alcohol. Maybe just say you're using vanilla beans. You know, here's the question. So here's here's part of the deal is that, you know, there's the rules and whether or not they're going to be able to tell. <laughs> that is, you know, th- th- I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair point to make as a judge myself, right? We expect you to follow the rules and to honor the rules and to play by the rules accordingly. The other side of it is, are we good? Are, are we as judges good enough to catch you if you don't? That's that's that is something to that is something that I always as a judge I always wonder about that. Like, are we, you know, like, are we really tasting anything? If, because the only way that a lot of these competitors may or these ingredients may be exposed is that a lot of times they have to tell us. They will tell the judges, but you know, are we really, are we sharp enough to catch these things? Now, that's the question as a competitor. You might ask yourself, how would they know? How would the judges know? You know, you do have to keep all of your ingredients available for us for inspection. And if you don't, that could be used against you. So, yeah, it's up to you. It's up to you. I can't I can't coach you in in any way on that on that respect. Because you never know who you're going to have. Sometimes you may get judges that really don't know what they're doing. And sometimes you may get guys, judges that are super seasoned, super well-trained, super, you know, super into the craft and they know their stuff. It's really kind of the luck of the draw. Uh, 512G, all ingredients must be disclosed upon request. There we are back to that again. Competitors must bring the original packaging of all ingredients used in their signature beverage for inspection by judges to verify ingredients. If the competitor does not provide original packaging when asked, the signature beverage will receive zero points in all categories available on the sensory score sheets in the signature beverage category. Now, one thing about this, this presume, this rule, the, the, I think the, foul, the, the difficult part of this rule is that it presumes that the competitor is using some kind of commercially available or produced product to make their to be part of the ingredients. Now, and it all depends on who, what kind of, you know, barista you are. Like if you're someone like myself or like a lot of people that I know and you really are going deep in it, you're going to be making every, you'll probably make just about every component of your drink from scratch. And so there's no manufacturer's packaging to work with. You've got, i got, i got, you know, I've got whatever I'm using and it's all, and it's right there. So I, but I think really that's just in case, you know, there's somebody trying to hoodwink the judges. And sometimes you get that, but for the most part, I've never really experienced anyone outright trying to deceive the competition. Like I've had people like, you know, do questionable things. And then we went to go talk to them about it. And got to the bottom of it. But I've never had one that was like outright trying to deceive everything. I'm not saying that hasn't happened. I think other other judges in the world have experienced that. I personally have not. All right. 512H. Just looking to see who might be responding because all, all the, the monitors are actually over that way. The preparation of signature beverage is captured in the well-explained, introduced, prepared category on the sensory score sheet. Signature beverage ingredients should be prepared and assembled on site during the competition time. Advanced preparation of ingredients is accepted when necessary, e.g. a 24-hour infusion. Pretty much anything, pretty much anything can be, most everything can be prepared ahead of time if you really want. It helps you, I think it helps your presentation to show the judges how you're making certain things. If you can, like, like let's say you are trying to infuse I don't know, let's say you're trying to infuse, uh, I don't know, um, neutral syrup with, with vanilla beans. It takes, maybe take you days to do it. Like you wouldn't do that in the, in the two minutes you have on stage. Like you could show them what you're doing. Like I'm going to split the bean and I'm going to put it in here, blah, blah, blah. But I wouldn't use that because it would be like, well, I'm not really, it's not ready. It's not right to you. So you could do you could do things like that. All right, five one two I. 
nothing other than ground coffee and water may, may be placed in the porta filters. Otherwise, the signature beverage will receive zero points in all categories available on the technical and sensory scores. I mean, that's now they're not just taking away all your points in the sensory, they're taking all the way the points in the <coughs> in the technical. So if you put anything in your porta filter other than coffee, you're getting hammered on it. And what that means is that, you know, you may, some people, I don't know if this is real, I'm, I presume that we have rules because these things have happened. You know, what goes in here should only be the coffee, nothing else. Put anything else, that's to your peril. I don't recommend you doing that. All right, so that's pretty much the definitions of the signature tree. Now let's look at signature drinks for uh on the score sheet so actually i should have i didn't put a link on that there but if you go if you kind of back up in the in the two links that i have in the description down below you'll be able to find the score sheet linkages and what you want to do is you want to pull up the score sheet the sensory score sheet and then here in the rules we're going to scroll down to what? I guess we're going to scroll down to section 15.3, which is called signature beverage evaluation, which is part two. And so I've got one of the score sheets here. And oh, so one of the things to, to bear in mind, this, if you notice here, there's this big black box at the bottom. And you'll notice that it says here, this is a non-scoring sensory judge. While at the qualifying rounds, while there are four sensory judges seated in front of the competitor, only two of those judges are actually scoring you. They're all scoring you, but the only ones that count are the two, I don't know, on the right or the left or whatever it is, depending on what you're facing, but only half of them are actually going to count. The other two, I think, are like, I don't understand if they're guest judges who are just visiting or if they're judges in training or whatever. But, you know, they, they did cut down the time from 15 minutes to 10. <clears throat> and, but you're still making four drinks. So I don't know. I think there's, a, they probably should just cut out those other two completely, just two, 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 just two and two and be done with it. Um, I don't really know what in the world you're supposed to do with those other two judges. Like, can I ignore them completely? Like, does it matter? <laughs> Actually, if I as a competitor, I'd want to know, like, do I have to serve those two? Like, do I care? I don't care about those two. They're not scoring me. I'm not, nothing. I could make them sixes drink. is not going to help me. Or so I can make them zero drinks and it doesn't matter. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how they're handling that. I didn't really notice that in the rules or anything, but. Those are things that, as a competitor, I would have questions about, right? All right, so first part of 15.3a is C5.1.2 for Sims drink definition. We just went through that. Again, if you have any questions, you're just joining us. We're going over the signature beverage um, creation for the Barista Championship, specifically the qualifying rounds that are happening this month in Baltimore. And uh, we're just going through the, the definitions and the score sheet right now and how to think about approaching the signature beverage. And then we'll go over some ideas about um, actual like pairing of ingredients and thinking about how to create the drink. Oh, we have a question. Hold on one second. And Thomas asks, don't the rules say something about having to serve the same drink to all judges? I think they did. <laughs> I mean, we, as a judge, we that's that's something we presume that the, the the rules have said over these. Now, the rules that they're using for the qualifying runs is different than the World Championship rules. They have they have adjusted it to meet the criterion, and that was a question that we have. I mean, you're supposed to serve all the drinks to the judges. Yes, yes. I mean, typically. But the, I think one of the questions that I, that I would be asking is, like, if only two of the four judges are scoring and you know who they are, <laughs> I mean, you have to serve all four. So, But, like, would you put less effort into the two that don't matter? Or, you know, I don't know. I don't know. These are questions to ask. But, yes, you should serve all 
it is better practice in the qualifying rounds to serve all four drinks to the judges because you're already making the effort to do it. So you might as well go through it and, and have it happen. And Tom Sell says, it could be harder to make the drinks differently than the same, to be honest. Oh, I, oh, I, don't, I don't disagree with you on that. I totally agree with you that if you were to make different drinks for the two judges, that would be, you, you would be putting an undue burden, an unnecessary burden upon yourself. I'm just wondering, like, let's say in, this, in the espresso round, you know, I, I would be looking, like, if I, let's say if I pull the two, the two sets of shots, right, and look at the four, at the four espressos, I'm going to probably think about, I'm going to choose the two that look awesome and serve those to the scoring judges, and those other two, bleh, serve them to the other two judges. Their score doesn't count. You know, I mean, we're, <laughs> I mean, this is probably not the best. Like, this is not, well, I don't know. Is this good coaching? This is probably like the, the Bill Belichick style of coaching for espresso competitions. <laughs> but, I mean, these are some things that I, as a, com as a competitor, I would be wondering, like, okay. Sh and uh, here's something that, that, like, you know, when you're in the, in the actual, like, full-scale four sets four scoring judges championship when you make your shots like if you need to re like if you're unhappy with one set like you put yourself at peril to make another set right like you just can't dis it it's it's another 30 to 45 seconds maybe up to a minute to burn for another set of shots right so like you really need to be on the money but if you burn two of them like if you if Two of them in the in the qualifiers are not as good. Man. Serve those to the other judges. I, I, these are these are some thoughts at least. All right, let's go on to fifteen three B. Signature beverage evaluations vary due to the variety of options presented by competitors. That's very true. Sensor judges will complete all steps of the evaluation before recording scores. Okay, that's fine. Now, if you look here on the score sheet, now we're looking at the score sheet. We're looking here in this section of the of the score sheet. You can see my notes from like our tastings of the espresso. The first section is well explained, introduced, and prepared. Fifteen three one, and there's a uh, four four cat four things that the judges should be thinking about when they are thinking about this score. The competitor, A, the competitor must explain their single drink to the judges. In order to achieve a high score, the explanation should include factual points such as the ingredients, preparation method, and the flavors and or aromas the judges will experience. The description should include the coffee used and the connection between the coffee and the other ingredients. So, well, part of what this is telling is that we as judges want to know as much as possible about your singed drink, right? Tell us how you made it. Tell us step by step. Like, you know, if you're in a cafe environment, if you're a working barista in a coffee shop, you've all experienced this. Like, you're hyped up about whatever drink you're serving, right? You're like, all right, this is awesome. Like, I made this awesome. And you might want to share that with the customer, right? And the customer is like, oh, this looks great. So thank you, man. I will use this kind of milk and I use this and I did this and I did this and I did this. And after a few moments, you realize that the customers kind of look at you like, thanks, dude. Like, cool. This is not that situation. This is a situation where the judges are more than interested to hear everything you have to say. In fact, the less you tell them, the more it could hurt you. So you really want to tell them pretty much how you made their drink, what you, what were the steps to making it. If you can show those steps, show them as you make it. Tell them as deep into detail why, how you did it. Also, what we want to know is why did you do it? Like here's something that we talk about in the competition rooms amongst the judges at, during deliberations. And it's like, why? Why these ingredients with this coffee? Why this coffee for these ingredients? What was the connection there? And a lot of times people don't tell us that. So that's kind of what we want to hear. All right, 531B, century judges will listen to the explanation of ingredients, preparation method, and the or, and use of coffee given by the competitor and take notes. Here's something to think about. When you're preparing your presentation, 
think about the judges writing. Okay, so I was just watching with a competitor, the, uh, a competitor for this competition the other day. We were watching Anthony Douglas's finalist finals presentation, the one that he used to win the world championship in Melbourne in last year. One of the things that I really enjoy about his presentation is that he takes the time to let you the or let the judges write, like blah, 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 blah. And then there's a natural pause and the judges have time to take the notes. Sometimes he'll direct them. Let's go back. This is, goes back to your ginger beverage, blah, 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 blah. And then you can write the notes. And those competitors are really few and far between. Like you get a lot of, like a lot of competitors feel that they have to give you all the information in the world about the coffee. They want to give, they've been in coffee for five years and they want to give you all their knowledge all in like 12 and a half minutes. And you're like, oh my gosh, okay, there's, and sometimes it's really good. Sometimes it's just, okay, superfluous. But the point is that a lot of times there's just not enough time to write. Like we teach the judges to keep contact, eye contact with you as much as possible. A really really well trained judge, really experienced judge will be able to listen to you, engage with you, always maintaining eye contact and hopefully they can write. Like I can kind of do it. The legibility may not be the best, but I can just go back and make my corrections and really understand it later. But otherwise, you really want to maintain that connection, right? You want to maintain, and really it's about respectability, like giving respect to the competitor that we're paying attention. Now, that's very difficult. To do that nonstop is very difficult because we do need to take notes in order to like evaluate your drink properly as well as give you great feedback later. Like, But if you don't give us the time to write, that becomes very difficult. So watch Anthony Douglas's presentation and he talks and try it yourself. Print out one of these sheets and follow along and write down what he tells you. And then that'll give you a good idea of like maybe how to start thinking about the way that you're going to give your presentation. And this is true across the board. Well, any of the ones that give presentation, right? Like if you're in take cup tasters, you don't have to worry about that kind of thing. <laughs> and Tom, Thomas says, I always got annoyed when the reasoning is obviously made up in BS, which is most... <laughs> I guess there's a lot of that. There's, a, And I wonder, like, maybe if there's the BS would be all right if they had greater conviction about what they're saying. Like, a, a lot of times during competition preparation, like, for the judges, um, I'll do, sometimes I'll be the one doing the uh, the barista run-through, right? So, and I'm using, I'm using a machine that I've never used, and I'm using coffee I've never, I have no idea what the coffee is. But I'll routinely make up complete and utter nonsense about the coffee you know I mean I'm basing it on stuff that I know in the real world but it's complete and utter like I've just conjured it up you know this coffee was from 2500 meters and it we we dried it we dried it in the patios for nine days and then a day in the Guardiolas and then we did it on raised beds you know some anyway that, that, that's that but I totally hear you on the BS I, I don't at the level that I work at and judge, I don't normally get, feel that there's a lot of BS being told to us by the competitors. I, I think the ones that the ones that I I get the most more of are the ones that just don't have enough don't have much experience and and like they're just struggling. They're just struggling to they're just struggling to make the drinks, much less tell you much about them. Like many of the competitors that I, I get to see are. are are really just trying to figure it out. And they're scared, they're sweating, they're like, they're ready to fall apart, you know? And I, I always feel, I always feel for them, so, you know, but it's like, I don't get too many of the BS stories. Probably because I don't but judge in the United States, but I don't know about that. I don't know for sure. All right, let's continue on. Uh, 531 Delta, judges will evaluate the center beverage based on competitors provided explanation and other observations made during the 10 minute presentation only. Any explanation given by the competitor after the completion of the presentation time will not be considered by the judges. So basically, once the competitor calls time and stops, um, whatever they may say after the point will not be regarded. So for example, some judges, some competitors, a lot of competitors will do their signature beverage last in the three drink presentation. and. 
you know, sometimes they're really coming down to the wire. Like they're down to the wire and they're like about to go over time or they've already gone over time. And so they want to stop as soon as they can. But once you say time, you whatever you can't tell, you have to tell the judges before you, you call time. So um, that's something else to consider is that you want to practice and be able to, to give your spiel before your 10 minutes up. Also, another thing to keep in mind is the overtime part of it, right? So overtime is, is a tricky thing because overtime is really the combination of two realm so the competitor has a preparation time of 10 minutes where they get to come out onto their station and set everything up and get ready for their presentation they have 10 minutes to do that and then they have 10 minutes to present but you only have 60 seconds over time from both sections combined the phone is quite busy today so, like, for example, we had a competitor in uh, one of the championships I was overseeing uh, last month where he had his 15-minute presentation preparation time, his preparation time, and he went over by, like, 90 seconds. And after they had told him, you need to come off the stage and you need to stop. Well, if you pass your six, you have a 60 seconds allotted to you for overtime. Once you pass that, you're done. You're disqualified, right? And I was like, this is someone, and this is someone that had been a competitor for several years. And I was like, well, what are you doing, man? Like I talked to him after the competition. I said, what are you doing? Like you know, the guys told you to get off. And he was like, I had to finish. And I was like, but you, so what that meant was that he went over time and disqualified during the preparation phase. So he totally blew it. Like he, he didn't even need to compete at that point because he had already been disqualified. So it's like, uh, I was like, dude, you're just so like, I don't understand why you would. And I was like, oh, come on. So be aware of that. Like, you know, on your preparation time and your presentation time, practice your preparation, really. Like if you're trying to win, practice the time that it takes you to set up all of your stuff and be ready. You know, you want to be done in eight minutes. Actually, you really want to be done in five minutes so that you can spend the next five minutes double checking your shots to make sure that they're on the money. Right, so try to be as simple as possible at the, at the qualifying rounds. The other side of it is that if you're if that's fine and you're in your prep in your presentation, you need to have time awareness. Right, there's going to be you have ten minutes to present, and then presuming you don't have any penalties from the pre from your preparation time, you have sixty seconds of overtime total in your for the presentation. Right, so you've got eleven minutes. So if you pass eleven minutes, you're toasted. You're done. You're fu you're done. You're just done. You have no way to recover. Disqualification means you have no way to recover. So don't disqualify. If you're running and you happen to run over time, you look, it's 10 minutes. Oh, gosh. Okay. And I have to tell them. So let's say you're like, oh, you're, you've served your drinks and you have to tell them you're 10, 10 05. Tell them as quick as you can. And then time. If you reach, and if you're like doing whatever and you reach 11 45 or 10 45, Stop. I tell, I tell all the competitors that I, I, I see, I have, and competitors mean, if you're at 45 seconds over and you notice you're 30, 30, 45 seconds over, just stop. Stop right there. doesn't matter where you want to present. Just stop. Why? Because you've, you have done part of your presentation. Even though you may not have completed it, you have done part of it. And there is probably still something left for them to judge and for you to have a score. Now, that score may or may not be enough to let you survive to the next round, but at least you've survived for that possibility. Once you reach disqualification, there's nothing to be there's nothing to be done at that point. You're you're just done. All right, and we're not gonna let's not let's not <laughs> we're not gonna believe at that point. I'm gonna move on. All right, and uh, next section. Appealing presentation, 1532. This is a yes or no question. Again, if you're just joining us, you can have a look. The links are in the description for the rules and regulations that we're looking over. And then if you just kind of maneuver around a little bit, you can find the, the link for the actual score sheets and you can download those and we can talk about them. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments over here. Or if you're watching the replay, drop them in the comments down below and I'll come back to them 
as soon as I possibly can. All right, so appealing presentation is the evaluation of the appearance and appeal of the signature beverage, including but not limited to the vessel, the beverage itself, garnishes, accessories, etc. The vessel served should look pleasing and highlight its beverage. If the signature beverage is not appealing, which includes chipped or cloudy dishware, or has a cluttered or disorganized presentation, a no will be giving an appealing presentation. So really, it's kind of the the, the it's a yes and no question. So it's a it's a one point thing, like or two points for this competition. Full, you know, and the question really is: Does it look nice enough to drink? Does does the judge look at it and think like I'm not going to drink that? Like, does it look disgusting? Like, you want to make it look pretty? Next one, five, three, three, functionality. Functionality is determined by how the signature beverage and related elements work while the drink is being consumed. Determined by the recent instructions on how to drink it, the dishware, garnishes, accessories, or instructions should not be a hindrance to drinking the beverage. Difficulty of consumption or consuming instructions or confusing instructions may result in a no being given to the functionality. I mean, how do we really work the Think about this in practical terms. How difficult is it for me to drink this drink? Can I drink it? Do I have to contort or move stuff out of the way to get to it? Like, really, you shouldn't have garnish. Don't put garnish in. What do you need that for? It's a barista competition, not, not a cocktail competition. Leave that for those guys. All right, next section. And I think this is one of the more difficult sections for both judges and competitors to really latch themselves onto creativity and synergy with coffee a judges will evaluate competitors creativity based on the originality of their concept and methods techniques or ingredients used in the preparation or presentation of the signature beverage ingredients must complement and elevate the coffee used while creating an interesting taste experience Singer beverages with a complementary blend of, com of creative ingredients and techniques will be rewarded with a high score remember that Com com complementary blend of ingredients, creative ingredients, and techniques. B, judges will evaluate the, the interaction between the flavor experience of the coffee and the signature beverage ingredients and how they come together to produce the overall flavor experience of the signature beverage through synergy. Synergy is defined as the interaction or cooperation of two or more substances to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their parts. A plus B equals C, not A plus B equals AB, if that makes sense to you. C, signature beverages that present a flavor profile that only mimics or matches the espresso's flavor profile will receive a lower score. Signature beverages that create a new flavor experience will be rewarded with a higher score. And how I tend to, to explain this to judges to, in a way to think about it is like, like I said, creativity and synergy. So it's kind of two questions Two sides of one question. So there's the creativity. So let's think about a drink. Like if you were to be out there in the world. <laughs> and Thomas says, don't make the judge poke their eye out by putting an umbrella in the drink. <laughs> yeah, the judges will not be willing to give you a high score for that. And, and, and there are ways to find other areas to be like, okay. It's only one point, but if you poke me in the eye, you know, we could do professionalism and attention to detail and knock you down there. But don't give, don't give, don't give the judge a reason to give you less points. <laughs> but like I was saying, so what I usually tell a lot of our, our judges is that one way to think about it, okay, so let's, I would tell them, you know, okay, so think about a drink. You've got espresso. I'm going to give you a drink now of espresso with cacao, and I'm going to give it with some milk. I'm going to whip it up. I'm going to mix it all up, right? Is that a creative drink? I think a lot of us can agree that the idea of espresso, chocolate, and milk is not a creative drink. Like, you see that everywhere. It's a mocha, right? We see that everywhere. There's not a shop in the world that offers espresso-based drinks that doesn't offer a mocha. So is that drink creative? Not really, because it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Now, if we think about those ingredients together, like a balance of those three ingredients, do they come together to create a better whole than, than their individual components? 
I think we can all agree that the general you've know, done well. Yeah. Like chocolate, espresso, and milk. Yeah, that's mochas are tasty, right? Well, I'll drink a I'll drink the heck out of a mocha, right? I think most people will. And I think that's where you can think about synergy. The, the ingredients come together to make a greater whole, right? So that's kind of the, I think that's one of the best ways to think about it as, as far as creativity synergy. Now, the question is, whatever you're going to be using for your sim drink, you want to find that kind of symbiotic, you know, relationship, that coming together of ingredients to be like delicious. I didn't think about it that way. Like we always talk about creativity, but is it delicious? Does it taste good? Like, do you drink it and you're like, I need to eat more? Like, for example, yesterday I finally had my first boudin. Like my cousin brought some boudin back from Louisiana. I cooked it up and I was like, this is amazing. Like, this is awesome. And it was so good that today for lunch, I was like, I'm going to make another batch of that. I, it was that good. Like, I'm like, ah, I'm going to have more. So what you want to do is create, try to find it. When you're putting together ingredients, Something that is like, ah, oh, that's delicious. That's delicious. Like, I, I want to drink more of that. Hope that makes sense. Again, questions, drop in the comments. Okay, taste experience. 1535. This is the next section. Taste experience, zero to six points, but with a two times multiplier. So these are important. You want to... The, a lot of these six scores have multipliers, so you want to capitalize on those as much as possible because those will help prepare, propel your points to higher levels. And hopefully you'll get to go to the nationals and then on to the worlds. Taste experience. Judges will ev evaluate the signature beverage based on how well the components, how, God, reading is so difficult. Judges will evaluate the signature beverage based on how well the taste components of the espresso, sweet, acidic, bitter, and the other ingredients fit together and complement each other in the total experience of the signature beverage. If one or more of the taste components detracts from the experience, like sour acridity, lower marks are given. If the taste component contributes positively to the beverage experience, higher marks are given. If the beverage is unbalanced, i.e. lacking in certain components that detract from the overall positive experience, or if a component is overpowering the beverage, the taste experience score is reduced. Note, accuracy is a description is not taken into consideration in this score. Okay, so again, we're talking about the components of the, uh, components of the espresso, the sweet, acid, acidic, and bitterness of the coffee. How well does that go with the ingredients that you put in it? And again, I think it goes back to, I, I think the easy way to think about this when you're approaching it is, does it taste delicious? Like, is this a delicious drink? Like, is it a delicious drink? And typically, if the drink is delicious, and, and not just to you, because, you know, you may be so in love with the ingredients that you conjure up in your mind that you'll, you're willing to do any kind of confirmation bias to make it work. But if you serve it to other people, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's hella good. That's delicious. Then I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry so much about the tactile, like, specifically about tactile experience. I'll just let that go. I'll, I'll let... I will let the, the idea that the flavors of my espresso with the ingredients that I'm using have come together, create such a delicious drink that the taste experience should be in line. Now, the next part of it, 1536, is accuracy of flavor descriptors. This is an important part of your role as the barista. Judges will listen to the flavor descriptors and explanations given by the competitor and compare those with the beverage served. The flavor, the flavor profile of the beverage should support specialty coffee, which means that it should taste, have positive notes. Like if you're using crappy commercial coffee that has tar and diesel notes to it, that would not be ideal. No matter how, no matter how much you may describe, oh yeah, there's a little bit of tar in there. Like, no, that's not acceptable. The score is based on how accurately those descriptors match the flavor of the signature beverages. The flavor descriptors must be given or score of zero. So again, you must tell the judges what they're going to taste before they taste it. Otherwise, you get zero. So that's not, that's, you lose out on potential 12 points because this also has a multiplier. But what you want to do is, once you've created your drink, you really want to sit down and decide, okay, this is the flavor components that I'm tasting. And you want to break it down as much as you can. The more accurate, so, so the more you can drill it down, probably the better, well, potentially the better. So for example, you could say it tastes like chocolate. Okay, chocolate's pretty generic. You could say it tastes like cacao. Cacao kind of narrows it right? You can narrow it down even more. Like it tastes like Cordillera 70% cocoi. 
which is a particular type of coverture that has notes of dark cherries. Now, you would have to explain it like that because otherwise, if you just said it tastes like 70% cocoy from Cordillera, that's made by Nacional de Chocolates in Colombia, unless the judge actually knows where that came from or, or knows what that means, they'll have no idea that it should have a dark cherry component to it. But if you tell them, you know, this is, has a, it's a, it's like a, it tastes like a 70% cacao with dark chocolate. With, it tastes like a 70% cacao that has notes of dark cherry. Now, if you if you produce a drink that actually has that flavor and they they can taste that and identify it as dark cherry chocolate, well, good lord, you could get some. That could propel your points higher. So it's a question of like, can you tell them how detailed can you give a description of what they're going to taste? The more accurate you can tell the judge what they will be tasting, the better your potential score. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, so that's pretty much the entire section here for scoring of the signature beverage. Now, on the score sheet, you'll see that they have this box here and these other things. You'll see in the score sheets, the judges will use these kind of diagrams, these type of things to diagram. Like what I'll typically do, like as a judge, is you know, if, if a competitor is telling me the different fl- the different ingredients of the coffee, of the signature beverage, I may put a line here, espresso, ingredient one, two, three, four, five, depending on how they're presenting it, depending on how they're assembling it, just to give me a visual reference and notes on to, as to what has been said. All right, so that's pretty much all the technical side of it. Now, the question is, what are you going to do for a signature drink? Now, and how do you create a signature drink? Now, of course, we have to bear in mind that our espresso must be a, a prominent component of the drink. Like you should take the judge should be able to taste that. And I think one of the best ways, or one of the yeah, you know, one of the best ways to really start to think about what you want to do is you know, think about, you know, first of all, you part of it's also like, you know. Conjuring up ideas. What kind of pie in the sky craziness do I am I thinking about? Like, for example, when I was competing back in the early 2000s, you know, in the USBC, like I remember one year I was, I was like, you know what? I, it was a uh, I found inspiration in Thomas Keller one year, who's the owner and chef of the French Laundry, and he made a he makes a drink called coffee and cigarettes, and I was like, that is just interesting. And so I kind of did a riff on his thing, and he he actually used actually it was kind of well, almost pretty much a blatant rip off of what he did, right? And so basically it was it was coffee and a cigar, and so we just created created a semi freddo cappuccino, right? So basically this semi frozen um, cream actually it was more yeah I guess it wasn't really that frozen. But basically what we did is we took the cream and we made componentry. We, we infused the component, the cream, with the tobacco from a cigar. Like I picked this cigar, the uh, the Paul Gamerian 15th anniversary cigar at the time. Robust, strong, a little bit fuerte, right? And basically I took the cigar, kind of cut it up, took the uh, the really nice quality heavy cream. I infused it for a few days into the you know the tobacco into the thing so it gave it this sweet tobacco flavor and then we made the the, the semi freddo out of it and then basically what it was it was just basically in a cup kind of like frozen sort of frozen and then pull the shot directly into it stir it and drink and it was really quite uh, an interesting drink we actually uh, one of the things that I I do as a competitor or what did do as a competitor was that everything we had we did had to be replicable in the shop environment. So we would actually offer our signature drink as a drink that customers could buy on a daily basis. If not, some of them went to our permanent menu. Some of them did not. Like our Hopia Cappuccino, that or Hopia, Hopia Macchiato, that was actually a signature drink from like 2005. And that... 
that was on our menu the entire run of the entire time. It's always been on our menu since. Um, but everything we did we would be on the menu because we it wanted. I noticed that a lot of braces in my era of competing were very much like, oh, you know, these are too complex to do in a shop. And I was like, it means you don't have enough guts. You don't have enough moxie to do it. Like, if you're making these one-off drinks, because to me, I think the singe beverage is what really kind of captures the imagination of the audience. Like, it's the most interesting, right? Everybody can go anywhere and buy espresso and mucky and lattes. But the sink drink is really kind of the interesting one. Like, this, and it's truly the vision of the barista. Like, oh, I want to try your vision. And so we would always offer our drinks, regardless of how complicated they became. We always wanted to offer. Like the most complicated one was the one we did in 2009, the last year that I competed, which I called, you know, I had this, like, I was, you know, again, here's this whole thing. You're like so mired in your like vision of what you want, what you believe in that, you know, you can't see. We, you may, so basically, I call it Homaris Conundrum, and basically, the name Homaris Conundrum is is based off Homaris Americanus, which is the scientific name for the uh, the main lobster. And so there was basically, and so one of my friends, uh, Kyle Glanville, who owns uh, um, you know a bunch of coffee shops out in Los Angeles, he at the time he was like, it's just called Lobspro. It's like, okay, that makes much more sense. But basically, it was it was a lobster based drink, so lobster and celery yak and cream and a whole bunch of truffles and vanilla and all kinds of ingredients into making this rather savory espresso beverage. And um, yeah, so you know you can get as creative as you want, and what you're looking for is something that's really delicious. So as you put together ingredients, think about that. And also remember, you're probably going to be working with one ounce of espresso per per drink. So you want to think about, you know, not going too crazy with your ingredients. Like it's great to have great ingredients, but you don't want to go too much. Meaning you don't want it to be overwhelmed. You don't want your espresso to be overwhelmed by the other ingredients. <laughs> and Thomas says, uh, might as well make a geoduck-based uh, drink. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Good ideas. Good ideas are coming. All right. So, like, you know, so some of the things to think about is, like, you know, what kind of things fascinate you? And, like, look, I, you know, right now I'm going to make a drink that we're just going to see how it is because I have no idea. But we're going to take the espresso. Let me reset the camera a little bit. All right. So we're going to take... All right, so today, like they say in the rules, we cannot use alcohol. One of the things I was thinking about earlier today is I wonder what espresso would taste like with something like a sweet wine. So I've got this. This is Giesen non-alcoholic Riesling from New Zealand. I was actually looking for free, or fray, free, and that's made by a California company. I forgot which one. And they didn't have the Riesling or the, the muscat. They had a muscat that I, I was drinking that I used in a drink at Spro. And um, so we're going to take that. And now we only need one shot, right? So we're going to have to pull the other shot into another vessel. All right, let's see. Let's see. Oh, that's... All right, all right.
to me, so alcohol is often Marsala wine. So probably like Tiramisu, ooh. I have not read the article on Breeze to Hustle there, Thomas. Um, look at that crema. Maybe this should be my sooner drink. Tastes like tiramisu, huh? Oh, let's see, let's see. Now, here's the thing. It's kind of... I think in this version, and this is like a five-ounce rocks glass. I think in this version, it's too washed out. So let's use... This espresso, and I'm going to pour maybe equivalent amount, one to one. Mm. I can't say that's delicious. There's a dryness on the finish that is not so pleasant. This is more fun, but the flavor of the espresso doesn't really pro that prominent, I don't think. Of course, I do have a bit of a cold today because the other night it was really cold where I was sleeping and I did not have adequate blanket control. There's kind of a juicy, like lemony character to this one. That's coming through better. Huh. All right, that's that wasn't the greatest of ideas. <laughs> All right, anyway, that's uh, just kind of a basic um, rundown on signature beverage and things to think about. Like, what you might want to think about is looking for – oh, goodness. There's a series of books made by Karen Page and Andrew Dornan. This is one of the other ones, Kitchen Creativity. And they have a book on flavors. And this is really kind of might be something that might help you uh, in your quest to think about different ingredients and flavors for beverage making. And, you know, this kind of, these are things that can just kind of help guide you. Oh, you know that dude? But they can like, you know, give you ideas, help you, I just like to help you ideas with um, on things that you might want to consider using in your in your espresso. Like I was thinking earlier today. Oh, what about these? Uh, the uh, what is that tree? That really fancy tonic water fruit giving tree or whatever it's called. Um, but then again, espresso tonic is not really creative, you know. So you want to look for something that that has good synergy, but also is creative. And if people have the difficult part, if people have seen it before, then it's probably not going to be that creative. So, you know, you have to kind of balance that in creativity synergy. Oh, Thomas was asking, what coffee was that? This is um, this what we call the Espresso 99 here from Spro Coffee. Uh, the coffee that I like to use for our espresso. It's basically, right now it's a, it's a blend. It's a 30-70 split between a Honduran natural that we get from uh, the Komayawa, from this family that we work with. And then um, the 70% is a wash coffee from the Huewe Tenango region of Guatemala. Uh, you know, again, really clean, nice coffees. Um, 
washed um, 14 days on the patios. Nice, nice coffee. It's probably a little bit of time in the Guardiolas. That one, I'm not sure. I imagine that they're, I mean, I imagine that their production is significant enough that I can't imagine everything is done on the patio. Like, we would have to have, like, something, like, really, really, like, specially produced and pay a lot more for <laughs> to have it fully dried on a patio, I imagine. Yes, very coffee tasting coffee. Nothing wild. Well, and here's the thing. So, like, this is something I find from competitors. All across the, the world, right? You know, you watch, they'll watch, like, the World Breeze the Championship and, like, the World Breeze the Champion or typically are these guys that are winning national champs. They're buying, like, extraordinary coffees, right? They're looking for 94 plus and whatever, and they're willing to pay hundreds of dollars per pound. And those are great coffees, right? Like, I think it's great. Those are great coffees. You can buy them and you could drink them, brew them at home and be like, ah, oh, this is some delicious nectar of the gods. The problem is in a competition setting, that's very difficult to do, right? What do we, and plus in a competition, we're not, this is a barista competition. It's not a coffee competition. This isn't CQI. We're not looking for the best coffee on, made in 2022. What we're looking for is a barista that can deliver. And so what part of that is a, as a person that has so much connection to their coffee, they can tell you, the judge, exactly what you're going to taste and experience before you taste and experience it. Do you need a 94-point coffee to do that? No. You just need to know your coffee. And so part of the reason I use this coffee, I'm going to be using this coffee is because, you know, it's a coffee that I know. It's a coffee I'm very familiar with. I mean, I blend, I source and blend, blend it myself. And I do that year around, year in, year out. So that probably gives me a competitive advantage in that respect. So think about that. that that's something, if you're, if you're thinking about competing, I don't think you need a really like, esoteric coffee. You just need a coffee you can talk about, that you can tell and describe accurately the flavors. And remember, the, the difficult part of the competition is that you may have been, you may have the best, you may have the most expensive coffee available. You may have been through training with, you know, the most expensive of training consultants. But it's still you. You still got to perform it, meaning that, like, you can still make a mistake. You can still muck things up along the way you're still going to be nervous. That's always going to be part of it. They're going to be nervous. So you want to have, I think that's something you want to have, something that's going to be maybe a little bit forgiving under pressure. I don't know. That's what I think. Yeah, nothing wild. Nothing too wild. We don't want too wild. Like, I don't need flavors of kumquats. Because I don't know if the judges will know what kumquats are to begin with. Like you, And that's, and that's another thing to consider is that, you know, what you're competing and where you're competing and who you're competing, who you're presenting to. Your judges will be from different backgrounds, different experiences, right? So let's say here in the United States, let's say you're in the United States, you get American judges. Ch chances are American judges will have an understanding of what you mean by apple pie. But if you're in other parts of the world or if you're at the world championships, you may have a panel of judges that doesn't really know what apple pie tastes like. Conversely, you may have someone say to you, it tastes like guayaba, it tastes like wanabana. If I'm an American judge and I've never had wanabana, well, how am I supposed to know what that tastes like? So be careful of what your, your descriptions, you know, try to find descriptions that are going to be understood by the judges that you present to. Because really, at the end of the day, one thing to think about is that your presentation is being done to judges. Not to the world, not to the people on the internet, not to people anywhere in the audience, as much as we may want that to be, but it's really to the judges and whether or not those judges have enough conceptual understanding of what you're trying to do or what, what you are doing or what anything about it, that's that's totally on the individual. Like, you know, there's maybe judges that don't understand what you're doing. How can they give you a good score? So you have to try to figure out how to make a presentation that 
pretty much what most anyone will understand. Because at this level, at the qual- if you're in the qualifying rounds, you really don't know how experienced the judges are. And I'm presuming that half of the judges being guest judges because they don't have much experience. And this is a way for them to gain experience before they go to judge at the Nationals in Portland this year. Kumquat also has a very present bitterness and astringency that's part of the fun of eating kumquats. So maybe don't use it. <laughs> as a note. Same with grapefruit, cranberry, and uh, pomelo. Good points. Good points all. Good points all. Good points all. I don't know if necessarily it's a – so here's the thing, though. Don't, don't think that necessarily bitter is a bad thing. Hopefully that you've had – you can prepare a beverage that has a balance between um, sweet – acidity and bitterness that's really kind of in the whole thing about taste experience like whether you're talking about taste experience of the company the, the cinch beverage or the espresso is that you we, we think about taste experience really we're thinking about it in terms of balance between those three salt sweet salt bitter sweet acidity bitterness we're thinking of them balance unless you're telling us that it's going to be overtly sweeter or overtly bitter which may or may not be a good thing, but you, what, you, what you were looking for ideally is a balance. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about what you're putting together. Try to find a balance of things. Again, I think that one of the best ways to think about it when you're craving signature drinks is to think in the terms of delicious. Is it delicious? Do I want to drink more of it? There's a lot of times that I drink these signature drinks in competition that I don't really want to drink anymore. Like, it's cool, but no. There's only been a few that were like, oh, that's really good. Like, I would drink more of that. So think about that. Keep that in mind. (laughs) Thomas is an acid feed. Excellent. And my preferred balance in coffee is no bitterness and astringency and a lot of acidity and sweetness. Nice, nice. I think a lot of people share that feeling. And sometimes I share that feeling as well. It's just a... (laughs) I totally hear you on that. All right. I guess that's good enough for now. Um, If you have any questions um, that you'd like me to look at in in future videos or in future live streams, drop those in the comments and let me know. Uh, Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope this has been a little bit helpful. As we get closer to the qualifiers, I'll probably come on with a couple more live streams to talk about like other aspects of the competition or maybe more drink development. Um, If you're trying to prepare for the competition, you have any questions about the rules? that you'd like me to, to, to maybe answer, let me know. I can uh, have a look at them and, and see. In case you might be wondering, I do, I am a rep for World Coffee Events, and so I do oversee um, the different championships of the World Coffee Events around the world. And uh, I don't normally, uh, I'm not, I don't normally work at the, at the, the local levels of the competitions, usually it's at the, the nationals, internationals, but I'm happy to, to answer any questions you might have. All right, so. That's good. Thomas and Mom, thank you for hanging out with me. I appreciate you being here. And uh, if you're free on Thursday nights, come join us for coffee and cigars on the channel. We are uh, we start at 8 p.m. Eastern and talk coffee and mostly smoke cigars for a couple hours. And there's a whole group of us that hang out together, and uh, it's a good time. We talk about whatever. So if you have the time, come and join us then. If not, see you next time, and thank you very much for tuning in. Have a great one.